Un whisky. Trois. Deux. Un. Stop. One. Pour moi, je suis prêt à démarrer les moteurs. Tu vas démarrer en allant y pour les moteurs. Alors pour le 1, c'est OK pour le 1. Welcome to Airbus. Welcome to the We Make It Fly Airbus podcast. I'm Jeff Burridge. And I'm Martin Aguera. In this series, we bring you the fascinating stories of the people that have played a part in making Airbus the extraordinary company that it is today. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the journey. One aspect of Airbus we haven't touched on yet, Martin, is Airbus helicopters. We're the world's number one manufacturer of both civil and military helicopters. Every other helicopter that's delivered across the world is an Airbus one. And so far, that totals over 12,000 aircraft that are flying, 3,000 customers, 150 countries. I could keep going with the facts. But the big one to remember is that it means business for Airbus helicopters totaling around 6 billion euros. Airbus helicopters is, is one of the two divisions inside of Airbus. And the men and, and women working in this division play a, a crucial part when we talk about we make it fly. I mean, they... Uh, produce some of the world's best helicopters out there. And what is probably just as impressive, I mean, there are lots of industry firsts in this division with uh, the products we have. In the history book is the world's fastest helicopter flight that was back in 2013 with the X-Cube demonstrator. Believe it or not, 255 knots. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's cool. And that translates to about over 450 kilometers an hour. And if anyone is listening and they want to have a look at what the X-Cube looks like, it's worth going onto the YouTube and typing in Airbus Helicopters X-Cube because uh, it's a pretty cool machine. It doesn't stop here. Already back in 2005, and that's what we're going to talk about today, we had another world record, the first and only helicopter to land on the world's highest mountain, the Mount Everest was one of our helicopters, the Ecuroy. Yeah, and as you say, that particular achievement is relevant for us today, as you've been discovering. Yes. The pilot who undertook that world-beating flight is Didier Del Sal. He's a leading helicopter test pilot within Airbus Helicopters, you know, someone who, who tests the limit of both man and machine. And I met with him in Marseille, in Marignan, at our plant uh, of Airbus Helicopters to hear more about his landing on the Everest in 2005 and his daily job as a test pilot. So let's have a listen. We're in Marignan at the uh, Airbus uh, Helicopters plant. Uh, we're just about to head out to the apron. It's a huge uh, tarmac where we can see a couple of uh, helicopters are parked and we're going to be meeting uh, someone very special who actually flies those aircraft. So let's have a look and, and go and look for him. Hey, there you are. Hello, Didier. Hi, then. Hi you. <laughs> Didier Del Sal, uh, you're an experimental test pilot here at Airbus Helicopters. Thanks for taking the time with us. Yes, yeah, so it's a pleasure for me to have you here and uh, to speak about some uh, our nice aircraft. Well, we're happy to talk more in detail about what you do. And uh, yeah, so let's uh, go outside and have a look. Let's go. We are just witnessing the, uh, the startup and the takeoff of an NH-90. Impressive. Just leaving the apron here of the Marignan site and getting ready for a last check, uh, uh, probably a radio check with the tower at Marseille Airport, and then it's going to take off for a test flight. Didier, aren't you proud when you see your baby take off every time? Yeah, it's always something uh, deep in the heart when I saw that flying. <laughs> How many hours have you flown on this particular airframe? In the Schneider, you have nearly 3,000 hours. In preparation for our interview, of course, uh, I looked a little bit at your biography, which is impressive. You started nearly 30 years ago as a test pilot for this company. What brought you to aviation? That's a long history, in, in fact. I was born not so far from here, nearly five kilometers away from here. And my father at the time was a flight mechanic on seaplanes uh, in the Navy. So uh, I could see the planes from the, my home. So I guess from early on it was obvious for you that you wanted to fly as well? Oh yes, because since my 
since the beginning of my rememberings, I can see myself uh, in the middle of uh, aircraft. My first remembering was uh, in Senegal, where uh, my father uh, has been stationed, uh, seeing the Father Christmas arriving on a seaplane, and for us it had that been one wonderful. Uh, I've never forget that. Uh, so when did you have your own hands on the control of an aircraft for the first time? I had the chance to have an uncle who was uh, flying and uh, who had his own airplane. So the real thing happened in the, I was 14, in fact, flying at the controls. Uh, that was my first lesson. And uh, after that, I was trying to find a seat everywhere in the small flying clubs, just not so far from my house. I went there washing the planes to get a free seat for just a traffic pattern around the airfield. <laughs> what were your feelings as a teenager when you took off for the first time and landed for the first time? Or oh, in fact, you have the, the very first day you can remember is when you are, you fly alone for the first time. The this solo. is the main important, the solo flight. And okay, uh, normally your, your teacher, your instructor, does not tell you that you will fly alone for the first time. So you make one pa one traffic pattern with your instructor and say, stop me here. Okay, okay, stop me here. Okay, uh, I've done some, something wrong. Maybe now the instructor is going out and say, now you do your traffic pattern alone. And this is a great moment because everything gets silent. Okay, now I'm alone. And you have to uh, evacuate all your fear, your thing, and concentrate on what you have to do, what you have learned. And after your childhood, you had gotten your, I guess, your civilian uh, pilot's license. You decided to go into the Air Force. What yes. did you did? You want to fly helicopters right then? I never thought about uh, helicopters at the time, so I entered the Air Force as a fighter pilot. I made the training. But I had a great disappointment that I discovered quite early that I was not made for air combat. I hurt my neck quite uh, deeply and I had to stop. But at the time, the Air Force said to me, uh, you are a good pilot, what about helicopters? So I was quite su surprised, helicopters, okay. And uh, I go for helicopter training and for me it had been uh, wonderful di discovery. Helicopters are so uh, so agile. You can take off vertically, go backwards, sideways, uh, up, down. Uh, it was nearly like flying a jet at much lower speed, of course, but the agility of the flying machine was nearly the, the same. The excitement was the, the same. So I was very happy, in fact. <laughs> And how long did you uh, then uh, uh, remain with the Air Force? I spent uh, 18 years in the Air Force, flying mostly search and rescue uh, missions, some very uh, special ops missions. Uh, we were assigned a lot of times in Africa, so we could fly in very harsh uh, conditions. It had been a great time, in fact. But uh, after uh, some years, I said, OK, now, I know uh, how to handle the helicopter, but the way was how it really flies. <laughs> you learn that when you are a student pilot, but you don't go too much in details. So I wanted to know those details. Then uh, Didi, I would say let's go into the prototype hangar and let's have a look, uh, let's have a close look into how the future is actually being built. This is the prototype shop. Uh -huh. As you can see, it's, this part is the oldest part of the factory. Huh? But uh, we love these hangars. Even if they look a little bit old now, it's really the heart of Airbus helicopters. Uh -huh. We probably have run about eight helicopters and more on the backside that are being worked on. Quite impressive, quite big. And Didier, being a test pilot, experimental test pilot, can you describe to us a little bit how that job looked like. When do you guys get involved into a program? Well, in fact, we are involved at the very beginning of the project. Even the basic specifications uh, of the helicopter, we are talking with the program manager, with uh, all the, the people. Even if the, there is no drawing of the helicopter, we are part of it. 
So I, I would imagine that when you get assigned a project to work on, you become very attached to it. Oh yes, it's like a baby for us. <laughs> we are uh, uh, following the, the project for even from how to design the seat, how to, how to uh, where to put the flight controls, uh, wha- what will be the shape of the windscreen, uh, where to put any switches. Uh, and do you have a specific baby in the fleet of Airbus helicopters? I have two. My light one, the AS350, the Ecureuil, and the big NH90, of course, I'm flying. So the Squirrel uh, since now 92, and uh, the NH90 is in 2005, so I consider them as my babies. <laughs> Speaking of the Ecureuil, with your biography, there is one specific event that is absolutely attached to that helicopter, your mission to Mount Everest, right? Tell us more about that specific mission when you were the first one to land a helicopter on the world's highest mountain. I've been part of the development of the one of the version of the 350B3 with an improved engine. And at the time, we felt that we have a lot of power. This helicopter was designed for a hot and high IIO work, for search and rescue in extreme conditions. So we could try something uh, big uh, with this uh, helicopter. So on that very day that when you did the mission, did you encounter any challenges on the way up? Oh, the challenges began uh, nearly one year before that because uh, of course we have to prove to all the people that it was feasible. After that, we have to operate in a flight envelope that we never went in before. And uh, so we began here by some flight tests at very high altitude. And uh, I remember one day uh, I flew up to 30,000 feet and uh, one colleague who was flying a fighter in the area to me, can you confirm you are 30,000 feet for a small helicopter? I say, yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> so after that, when uh, we had the green light to go there, I had to, uh, to, to discover how it was to fly in the Himalaya mountains at such altitude. The, the discoveries I made was quite... Uh, strange and we were not prepared for, for that in fact we had imagined a lot of scenarios but uh, on one side of the mountain the updraft were so powerful that like i could cut all the power of the helicopter and still climbing mm-hmm. so you can imagine it was not possible for me to reach the summit because i was passing just above the summit but you can imagine also on the river side the downdraft were so powerful that with the full power of the engine, 60 or 70 miles an hour indicated on the anemometer, I was going backwards. And to escape this kind of, of situation, I mean, uh, quite touchy um, a bit. So what I had to do there is to find the right way between updraft and downdraft to go to the summit. And did you actually touch down up there? Yes, because uh, in fact you have to validate the record. Uh, by the rules, you have to stay on the summit for at least two minutes. I counted the seconds, but I counted a little bit too low and I stayed in fact four minutes there. <laughs> <laughs> On the left side, we see the NH-90. This helicopter is the first operational helicopter flying with fly-by-wire. For us, it's, uh, the, it had been a very big challenge. So why fly by wire? Because uh, it's to make the job of the pilot more and more simple. The other part of the NH-90 is it's uh, fully integrated helicopters. All the sensors, all the systems of the helicopters are uh, talking together. Actually, the NH-90 is still a relatively young member of the, the helicopter's fleet, but you're always looking at progressing the technologies uh, inside helicopters. What will be the next steps? What is the next breakthrough that is likely to come in the world of helicopter aviation? Of course, as you said, the NH-90 is a quite new aircraft, but we are uh, already looking to the future. So we are working now on the midlife upgrade of the NH-90 and uh, those new systems we will put will be the basis of the new generation uh, helicopters. Okay, let's go and see the NH-90 prototype from uh, inside. So, 
the light helicopter, the prototypes, yeah, and the big there. So also your living room, more or less, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Uh, sure. Let's go inside. From the outside, it's an old one because we are performing a lot of changes. This one is flying now for 15 years and nearly with a different configuration every week. <laughs> and you guys are allowed to do the things that a normal pilot would not be allowed to do, right? Yes, uh, of course, because we have a specific rating, we have a specific school when we learn how to fly near the limits. That's the job of the of test pilot. And are we allowed to go inside and yes, have a look? Uh, yes, please. So, we're inside the NH-90 prototype and the idea is just coming yeah, around the... inside because you can see we have a, a lot of orange wire everywhere. Yes, this is certainly not the VIP configuration. Not at all. <laughs> wow. Yes, as you can see, NH-90 cockpit is a very wide one. We have a, a lot of uh, windows uh, for the external visibility, of course, Great. because this aircraft has to go in very confined area at night in very harsh conditions. And it's absolutely comfortable, I have to say. It's very wide, as you say. I'm amazed by it. All these switches, it must be a nightmare to learn all of this, what they mean. Oh, in fact, not at all. When you are used to, because you know they are set by functions, in fact. If you want to uh, go on the fuel system, for example, fuel system is there. So you have all the switches of the fuel system here. So and that's part of the test pilot job to organize, in fact, all those uh, switches. The first, at first glance, yes, it's a nightmare. You have a lot of switches uh, everywhere. But when you think about the functionality of the switching, it's quite easy. And you, as you described, you have been part from the onset to ensure this efficient handling of the helicopter in flight. It's made by pilots for pilots. Yes. Um, so when we look at all of this, we see... On your side of the cockpit, two big screens. On my side of the cockpit, on the right side, two big screens. What does all this actually do? In fact, this is the good things of new technologies. All these screens are identical. The air crew can organize its own cockpit. On the helicopter, the flying pilot is on the right side and the mission commander is on the left side. Normally on the screens in front of the pilot, you have the normal flying instruments, the airspeed, the artificial horizon, altitude, na navigation. And on the left side, you have the operational side with maps, with uh, tactical situations or electronic warfare system. I could imagine that the NH-90 was probably one of the first, uh, let me call it, digital or computized helicopters. How was it flying the helicopter earlier than that? Earlier than that, in fact, you had a lot of gauges everywhere. Each function had its own switches. Now, for example, you have this big digital keyboard, which can talk to all the systems of the aircraft. To reduce the number of switches, to reduce the lost time by the air crew to go between uh, so many uh, gauges or switches we had before. You can do more with less. More with less, yes. Thanks for this quick overview here inside the cockpit, Didier. This is very impressive. But now let's move from the prototyping to the actual production line, and that's going to be in another hangar. So let's have a look, please. So we put the helmets on, Didier, and the safety shoes, so we're ready to enter the production line of the NH-90. Let's have a look. We're actually coming from your main playground, the prototype hangar, now into the production facility. We can hear there's lots going on, uh, see a lot of people working on all kinds of uh, airframes here right now. So, did you tell us what are people doing here actually? Yeah. This is the birthplace of uh, the NH90 in France. This is the final assembly line where we uh, put together all the big parts of the airframe uh, of the aircraft and 
when all the systems are integrated. In front of uh, one uh, NH90 that's been partly dismantled, uh, we have people inside the cockpit looking at the electronics, at the wires. We spoke a lot about your roles and responsibility as an experiment test pilot. And obviously, you guys, your team has a crucial role to play in making these aircraft fly. But what we can see here is there is a lot more involved. Tell us how important is teamwork in this whole system from the the basic design guys who are drawn the first drawing of the aircraft to uh, all those mechanics we can see uh, around us it's a chain responsibility in fact and uh, for us flying crews we have to trust all the people down and we respect them a lot because they make us fly how often did you have to come back to a crew chief and tell him that you broke some sort of uh, some system in his aircraft Uh, these are you are talking about things we don't <laughs> like, of course. But during prototype flight test, we have to demonstrate. We have to go up to the limits. Sometimes, yes, we can break some parts of the helicopter, and we are each time quite ashamed. But it, that's part of, of the job to demonstrate up to where we can go. You're a man in love with flying helicopters. It's obvious. You have accumulated more than 10,000 flying hours in helicopters. You have flown pretty much every helicopter in the Airbus world. You told me earlier you've got two more years to go until you reach the age where you could possibly retire. What is it still that you would like to achieve while flying in the next couple of years? As a prototype test pilot, you are always uh, working with the latest technology. So you still want to, to learn each day, even to the very last day, you want to have new system to see new, new systems or to fly a new helicopter. Even to the very last day, you are still at the top. Well, Martin, that was a great day you had talking to Didier, and it reminded me in some ways of my early career. I was working on helicopters nowhere near as exciting as being a test pilot, but it's how I got into aviation. But you had a great day. It was a fantastic day. You know, I'm a I'm an F geek per se, and uh, talking to the people, you know, who make it fly is just is just something I, I really enjoy. I have to admit, I have never really been a rotor geek, but uh, I'm getting there. You know, talking to Didier today, was certainly fascinating hearing him about landing on the Mount Everest and how he accomplished that. I mean, it takes guts to do this, right? Yeah, absolutely. These guys, that shows their passion, it shows their spirit, it shows their professionalism and their dedication. You know, these guys had a plan and they made it happen. That's right, yeah. And what about the site itself in Mar Marseille? It's a lovely location in Marignan. You know, one of the one of the great experiences I have with Marignan was also a helicopter flight. That's many years ago. I had the uh, the pleasure of, of experiencing a helicopter flight and, uh, you know, the scenery here on the, at the sea with the cliffs at the coast um, is amazing. Jeff, I suppose, um, I mean, you've been working on, on helicopters, so I suppose you probably also have a story to share on how it is to fly helicopters, right? Yeah, well, yeah, I wasn't flying, but I was. I certainly had a great experience uh, <laughs> in the back of an old Wessex, actually, it was when, um, and we flew down to Exmoor in the UK, the Moors, and uh, with the side doors open, the pilot was taking it through some low-level sorties. So we were like, swinging left swinging right through through the moors and it was amazing 100 feet off the ground and a great experience to be strapped in opposite the door where one minute you're looking at the sky and next minute you're looking at the ground yeah i can imagine that was probably a rough flight too yeah this is this is the kind of stuff that didier uh does uh, for a living i mean he showed us today how passionate uh he does his job and the experience of these people is so important to make sure that the that the aircraft and the helicopters we produce are safe to fly, are are delivering all, you know, what they should deliver to the customers, and seeing that how it's being done, and that was just a small glimpse today, uh, was quite quite amazing. That's good, Martin. It sounds like you really enjoyed it. Absolutely. That concludes this edition of We Make It Fly. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to rate and review us. And you can follow us on social media. Use the hashtag WeMakeItFly to get in touch. Give us your feedback, good, bad, indifferent. We want to know what you think. This program was made by Earshot Strategies. The executive producer is Richard Myron. Another production undertaken by Anouk Mie. 
I'm Jeff Burridge, and I was joined by Martin Aguera. Thanks for listening. Bye.